I encourage you this week to uh, avail yourself of those True Life cards. I have never, in three years of handing them out, have never had one person refuse it, not one. In fact, uh, even this past week, I had the opportunity uh, to hand one out, and the person, uh, I, I was actually leaving a store where I was uh, having something done, and I was walking out, and I, I thought, no, I'm gonna turn around, and I went back and, and uh, asked the girl if she'd uh, like to take an invitation from uh, me for our church, and her face just lit up. She was just excited about that. I was able to show her the reverse side of the card, which is uh, the place where you can go and obviously find information out and have questions answered. And she was very uh, interested in that. And Steve will love this. I, I actually took my phone out then, and she had questions about where the church was located and so forth. And I was able to go to our app. Don't you love it? And, and say, here it is right here, and this is how you get the app, and, and you can have all of that information right there as well. So and she was really appreciative of that. So that was exciting. Uh, also, a uh, week before last, I had someone ask me about uh, a question that uh, actually a lot of uh, people are talking about it right now and asking, uh, can a person who's never heard the go- about Jesus be saved? Can they go to heaven if they've never heard about Jesus? A lot of small groups talking about that, and they had some questions, and uh, I had gone to truelife.org, and there's a brand new video there with Dr. Paige Patterson from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary talking all about it. He's got some great video, and he is profound. There is so much profoundness in that video. I encourage you, if you're just wanting to do something profitable with your computer, go to truelife.org. Check it out. There's some really good stuff there, and uh, you'll be able to use those tools as you talk to people. General walk of life, I am uh, pretty sure of that. So just uh, take advantage of that. We're going to next Sunday, by the way, when we come together, uh, take the time to share. If you have uh, given out some of those cards, and I said the cards are out there on the table when you walk by, no offense if you don't want them, maybe you have your own plan, Um, that's fine. But if you'd like to utilize them, that's great, and we'll share some testimonies next week. And so uh, uh, just, uh, I'm... A lot of times, as we're going to talk about it actually this morning in the message, sometimes you never know what happens to that card. You don't know if it's just thrown away, if it's, if it's something that's viewed by 25 people that week. You just really don't know, but we'll share a little bit about that next week, all right? Well, these guys are getting tired holding those Bibles, so uh, if you uh, have need of a, a Bible this morning, just slip up your hand. They'll make sure that you receive one today. Happy to be able to follow along in the scriptures. First Thessalonians is where we are today. We'll be looking at the entirety of chapter 3, which is 13 verses this morning. As we've been going through this great book of Scripture, the Apostle Paul is, as you know, not able to be physically with the Thessalonian believers. He's not had the opportunity uh, to minister directly with them after sowing the seeds of the gospel and being persecuted, driven out of Thessalonica. He had to go on to other cities, and he is very, very concerned for these people. And we're going to notice this morning uh, that there are some reasons for concern on the part of the Apostle Paul, but then there's also some reasons for rejoicing as well. This morning as we look at the scriptures, let's pray and ask God to bless our time in his word, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you so very much for giving to us the words that are before us today. Lord, as we open your word, as we explore it, help us to understand it. Help us, Father, as we come to this passage, no matter where we are in life, to benefit from it today. Lord, if we're here today and we're not sure about our eternal destination, perhaps we have been trying our different ways to be approved by God and have never really understood that the only way to gain access to heaven is through Jesus and faith in him. May our hearts be challenged that way. Father, if we're discouraged, maybe we've been serving for quite a while in your church And we're discouraged, Lord, because we haven't seen fruit. May we find ourselves encouraged today. Maybe we struggle with sin, Lord. We all certainly do, Father. And yet we're reminded that there's a future day when we will be blameless and holy in your sight. Father, how we look at this scripture today will truly be according to your will. May the Spirit of God work in our hearts. May we walk away benefiting greatly today from your word, I pray in Christ's name, amen. 
this morning when you stop and you consider the Thessalonican church. We can say this morning we need to emulate the good qualities of the Thessalonian church and remember that our labor for Christ may or may not produce visible results on this side of glory. Title of the message this morning is A Glimpse of Glory. The Apostle Paul has been very concerned for these people, and we pick this up immediately here in chapter three and verse one, where it says, therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone. You may remember that as we were going through the passages of scripture leading up to our study in Thessalonians, we went to uh, chapter 17 in the book of Acts. And we found there the whole description for how Paul's second missionary journey stopped there at Thessaloniki, this Greek city that is so vital to that area. And how he labored three different Sabbaths, the Bible says, in the synagogue, giving forth the gospel. And then, as you know, some believed. But Paul suffered persecution at the hands of the Jews from that synagogue, and he was run out of town. Fleeing for his life, he goes to another city by the name of Berea. Ultimately, there he's driven out as well, and he finds himself in the place there called Athens. But before he would leave and set sail and and go away from Athens, they sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, fellow laborer of the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. So before they would leave the area, before they would leave the region, they would make certain that these believers, these new fledgling Christians, would somehow be discipled. Remember, the goal of discipleship is to walk worthy, and the word walk, peripateto, is talking about our manner of life, especially with areas of morality concerned. We are to walk in a manner that reflects our calling and the weight of our calling by God. So this is the goal of discipleship. I wanna live my life in a way that pleases God. We can just kinda boil it down. This is what Timothy is supposed to be doing here. He's supposed to be establishing these believers in their faith, and he is to be encouraging them. There was a great need to be encouraged. As the Apostle Paul looks at the church at Thessalonians, there's a lot Paul doesn't know at this point. There's a lot that he is really hoping is going well, but he's not 100% sure. And this is why he sends, along with Silas, they send Timothy back. There were concerns that Paul had. There was the inevitability of resistance. And these uh, concerns that Paul has really break down into two areas. The first is affliction, and you'll notice this here in verse three, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. So the first area that Paul finds himself concerned about is these afflictions. He knows that when he's run out of town by these these Jews who are, are so zealous, he knows that they are very, very angry about the gospel. They don't want anyone else to believe that Jesus is truly the Messiah. And so he finds that as these Thessalonican Christians are trying to survive there, they're trying to survive in the midst of all types of persecutions and afflictions associated with their faith. Paul says here in verse three that no one should be shaken. The word shaken there is is literally speaking of wavering back and forth. It was actually a word that was used of a dog's tail. We have a yellow lab and if it's standing next to the dining room table and its tail is going against the thing, it, it sounds like a drum. I mean, it's like, whack, 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 whack. And it's like, come on, you're gonna wake the whole house up. I mean, it's just crazy. Whack, 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 whack. When you take the dog out or you take the dog's food and you put it in the dish, you know what's going on. It's like, these dogs are made to go through the water, I think, with their tails. Well, it's, it's fun and it's cute when you think of a dog and the dog's wagging his tail. Maybe you have one of those little dogs with a cut-off tail and it only goes like this. <laughs> Maybe you got one that's got a big tail and it wipes everything off of the coffee table. Just swoosh and everything's gone. Whatever it might be, the reality is that that's funny for a dog, but it's not funny for us Christians. 
Paul says, I'm concerned that these afflictions would cause you to waver, that you'd go back and forth on your faith, that you'd be, you'd be truly shaken. And so he recognizes this, and it's interesting that he says there in verse three, you yourselves know, even though you are a young, fledgling bunch of Christians, this much you know, that you're appointed to this. I find that fascinating. Certainly Peter knew about persecution, didn't he? But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, Peter says, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. Peter knew. Peter knew that suffering was absolutely not something abnormal whatsoever. It was very, very much in the realm of normalcy. You say, well, Pastor Kevin, we don't really suffer those types of persecutions. Well, the point is, we do suffer afflictions. All of us here, if we wanted to be honest, would say we suffer from some type of affliction. There's something that you've gone through in life or you're going through today. There are afflictions that face all of us. But one thing is clear, and Jesus makes this point aptly here in John 15. Jesus says, if the world hates you, better yet understood it, since the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. Now ask yourself this question, why in the world would anyone want to hate Jesus? Every single word that ever proceeded out of Jesus' mouth was said with pure motivation, absolute truth, and love and compassion. Isn't that amazing? You and I can't say that, can we? <laughs> Not even close. I mean, I, you know, we don't feed thousands of people. Jesus even fed thousands of people. Even Jesus with his healing ministry was amazing, was it not? People from all over the countryside would come and Jesus would heal. Jesus is the embodiment of someone who I love. And if he was here today, we would love him too, provided we were one of his sheep. You see, the problem is, as he says, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. You see, the, the, the problem for the Thessalonican Christians was that before Paul came to town, everybody loved them. They were just one of the guys, one of the gals. They were just normal, normal people. But now everything's changed. They're not of the world anymore. Things are different for them. What's he say there? He says, but because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. You see, you're not of the world anymore. What's that mean? Well, it means that now you're different. Now you're seeking to live as Jesus modeled life, and you're seeking to show forth the righteousness of God as you live out your life. You're trying to live a, a life of holiness. You see, your standard now is different, and you're quest in life is different quite frankly and the world is looking at you and they are not in agreement with what you're seeking to do in fact you're bothering them by seeking to live a righteous life you are an irritant to them beforehand everything was great you did the same things they did you thought the same ways things they thought of you told the same jokes everything every life was just going the same direction now you've changed jesus says you're not of the world remember the word he says i said to you a slave is not greater than his master and that equation who's the master jesus go back to the first sentence if the world hates you you know that it's hated me before it's hated you you see jesus the master is hated and so we his followers are going to be hated then as well are we not Paul is looking at the Thessalonian church and he is concerned over their afflictions. What they're facing was not unusual. They knew that this was part of the Christian walk. They knew they were called to this. But Paul is still concerned. Second thing Paul is concerned with is the spiritual warfare aspect. We pick this up in verse, verse five. He says here, for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be 
in vain. So he says here, you're gonna suffer tribulation, but it's not all about the afflictions at the hands of men. There is more to what is happening in this Christian life than just the afflictions by those around you. There is spiritual warfare at hand, and the Apostle Paul is looking at this church And at this point in time, he's looking from a standpoint of looking from a a backward position, and he said, I I was really concerned that maybe the tempter, Satan. This is the same word that's used uh, for Satan when he tempted Jesus. This tempter might have diverted you from your faith. I think of the parable of the sower. You remember the parable of the sower. Jesus is sowing, uh, teaching about the sower who is sowing and in that uh, the, the sower is giving forth the gospel. The gospel is falling on the ground and Jesus identifies different types of reactions. There's different soils that are there. In fact, some fall on the wayside of the path or the area where you want to plant. Then the birds of the air came down and they ate it and that was the end of that seed. Other seed fell onto stony ground, never really could get its roots down at all. Some went into some ground that was shallow and it sprung up immediately, but then when the pressures of the world came, it was, it was gone soon, withered away, never bear, bore any fruit. In fact, none of them bear any fruit except for the one where the roots go down deep, the plant comes up, and there's fruit there. You see, Paul is concerned for good reason. He's not sure what's happened there with the gospel. And he knows that Satan is doing everything in his power to knock the gospel down so that it doesn't take root. Paul knew that this was ongoing. He knew it from the start. He knew that every single church, every place he went, there was without a doubt an adverse reaction from the adversary. He uses a participle here to indicate that this was no doubt going on. And he has good reason. We've, we've talked about the Thessalonican church. I, I, have I given you the impression that this church is super spiritual? I mean, they sound forth the gospel. I mean, they've got all these great things. Woohoo! I mean, you know, yes. And it's true that the power of the gospel has been demonstrated there without any question. But just when you thought you'd found the perfect church, I find out that there's no such thing. In chapter four, the Apostle Paul, and we're not gonna go there until next week, but the Apostle Paul goes into some of the issues that were concerning them. You see, they lived their Christian life believing in the imminency of Christ's return. They really did. And in fact, at some point, they're like confused. Did he already come? And they're looking for the coming of the Lord Jesus. But here's the reverse side of that. If you believe that Jesus is going to come next Sunday, you might live your life well this week, because you're preparing for that, or you might not. You might say, ah, oh, you know, what does it matter how I live? If Jesus is coming and grace covers all my sin, then I'm just going to delve into sin. Say, that's not very good. You're right. But that's what some of them were thinking in Thessalonica. Whoops. Some of them said, you know what? Jesus is coming back. I'm quitting my job. And Paul has to rebuke them in chapter four and say, listen, you guys need to get back to work. We don't know when he's coming back. Some of you are thinking, oh, great, I can quit my job this week. Finally tell the boss, you know, forget it. I'm just waiting on a mountain for Jesus. See, that was the mentality of some of these people. You see, this is why Paul says in chapter three in verse 10, he talks about them lacking. He says, I wanna come because he says, I wanna come and and see you face to face and perfect or complete what is lacking in your faith. There were certain things that were lacking in their faith. In fact, there's certain things that lack in all of our faith. It's not a perfect church. These are not perfect people. And Paul is concerned that the afflictions of this life and the temptation from Satan to quit might come to bear upon their heart and they might throw off 
the following that they've had of Jesus. You see, it is very noteworthy that we can never lose our salvation. Once you place your faith and trust in Christ, God makes sure that we can't lose it, but we can walk away from the Lord and not serve him. Things can get difficult, and we all know people like that today, and we have no doubt experienced that temptation in our own hearts as well. So here is Paul's concern. There's an inevitability of resistance, there's afflictions, there's the tempter, but there's also a reason for rejoicing in this passage. And this is really kind of cool because when, when you look at what's happening here, you see this glimpse, I would term it, of glory. For Paul is going to be able to look at some of the good things, but he says this in verse six. Pick this up with me in verse six if you would. But now he says that Timothy has come to us from you. Okay, so in the verses one through five, he's, he's recollecting how it was and he was concerned about hearing how they were doing spiritually. Now in verse six, he gives us the update and he says, but now that Timothy has come to us from you, he's brought us good news. Woohoo! he's excited. There is good news of your faith and your love and that you always have good remembrances of us and we have good remembrances of you. You want us to come. We want to meet you. It's almost like two lovers on the sides of the ocean, you know? We just love each other and we just want to see each other. But Paul would say, therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, verse 7, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. Sometimes we think of Paul, the apostle, as being superhuman in his spirituality as well. But Paul was human just like you're human. And there were times when Paul was discouraged. Paul would go from city to city, and oftentimes on his missionary journey when persecution was following right behind him, he never heard what the result was. He never heard about the gospel's effect upon the people there. He didn't know what had happened, what had transpired. And so here he is, and he's, he's recollecting the fact that he was not even sure until they sent Timothy back what had happened. Sure, Timothy was there. He was trying to establish them and encourage them, but eventually Timothy leaves, and they don't know what the outcome is. Paul has this glimpse of glory, and it is wonderful for him. And you can see how it just buoys his heart and spirit. Because he is saying, in all of our affliction, when we were distressed, no, we weren't in danger of wavering in our faith. He doesn't say that at all. He says, but we were comforted concerning you. There was a measure of peace and joy that came upon the life of the Apostle Paul because he had the opportunity to get that glimpse of glory and see some of the results. Some of you have been serving the Lord for a long time and you don't see a lot of results. Sometimes you think to yourself, man, oh man, you know, I've been serving with the Iwanas for 25 years and you know, I don't see any of those kids walking up to me and asking me if they can put their faith in Jesus and you know, I'm just doing the game director thing and week after week I just watch kids run around a circle. <laughs> Some of you are busy and, and, and you're, you're doing the work of the gospel and yet you're not seeing results. To just get that glimpse of glory, to be able to see some type of impact is, is so heartening for us, isn't it? Not everyone gets to see that. Paul is able to have this reality of rejoicing. As he looks at the Thessalonians, he realizes the more we grow and abound in grace, and particularly the attribute of love, the more there's evidence that we're established and confirmed in our truth, in the truth. And this is what Paul is thinking when he thinks of the Thessalonians. He's thinking, man, there's a lot here. I've heard this good news of your faith and your love. And it buoyed him, encouraged him. Not everyone has the opportunity to do that. Will you keep on serving the Lord even though you don't see the results of your service? In 1912, there was a medical missionary by the name of Dr. Leslie, Dr. William Leslie. 
He went to live and minister to a tribal people in the corner of the Republic of Congo in Africa, 1912 this is, and he ministers there for 17 years. When he gets there, he is involved in clearing land and trying to make an area there on this river where he can have his base. It was infested with leopards and there were cannibals in the area. So um, yeah, he's one of these missionaries you read about, right? After 17 years, this missionary, Dr. William Leslie, he was a medical doctor returned to the United States a discouraged man because he failed, he believed, to make any impact for Christ whatsoever in those 17 years. He came back to the United States and he died nine years later. Now, here's the good part, you ready? 2010, so not that long ago, right? You with me? 2010, a team led by a man named Eric Ramsey along with Tom Cox and the World Ministries made a shocking and sensational discovery. They went to this very area. It was not easy to get there. They flew east from Kinshasa to Vanga. It was a two and a half hour flight. Once they got there, uh, they reached this village. They hiked a mile to the river, Kualu River, and they used a dugout canoe to go a half a mile across a very dangerous river hippopotamuses that just really don't like dugout canoes. Then they hiked with backpacks 10 miles in to get to the very first village. Now based upon their previous research, they thought that the Yanseys, the people group in that remote area, might have some exposure to the name of Jesus, but they probably didn't have any real understanding of who he is. They were unprepared for what they found. When they got there, they found a network of reproducing churches throughout the jungle. Every village had its own, listen to this, gospel choir. They didn't call it a gospel choir, but that's what they had. And they actually had sing-offs where there was competition to see who had a better choir. Oh, wow. In all of the eight villages that they visited, there was a vibrant church functioning there. Here's the cool part. They even found a 1,000 seat stone cathedral in one of the villages, 1,000 seats. Mercy, if they can do that in Africa, we should be able to do that here, eh? Amen. You see, what was so neat was that back in the 1980s, they were able in the 1980s to fill that up so much so, people were walking for miles to this big cathedral to worship, and they decided that they were going to start churches instead of filling up the thousand-seat auditorium anymore out there in the jungle. And they began with all these branch ministries. That's happening in the Congo. Isn't that fantastic? Dr. William Leslie came back to the United States after 17 years of ministry, totally depressed and discouraged, believing that he had had no vital impact on that area for Christ whatsoever, and died nine years later. Now he's up in heaven, and he knows the whole story. Is that exciting? You see, the Apostle Paul would look at these people and he would say to them here, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. And he says that what we are so excited about is the fact that the words that we spoke to you, the work that we do was not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that what? Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The apostle Paul came to learn that. He began to learn just as you and I learn that the work that we do for Christ, the sowing of the seeds of the gospel, does produce fruit. If it wasn't true, then Jesus would not have said Pray, therefore, for laborers to come to the harvest because the fields are brilliant, they're glowing, they're ready to be picked. That, my friends, is true today as it was in Jesus' day. And some of you may be here this morning and you may be interested in placing your faith in Jesus Christ as well. Maybe it's been something that you've been thinking about, but you've not yet placed your faith in Jesus. Do you know today in our country, there are churches just like Faith Community Church that are preaching forth the 
glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And there are people in our country that are placing their faith in Jesus today. It's happening. It's happening. And so the Apostle Paul catches this glimpse of glory. How fantastic is that? He is absolutely encouraged. But not only is it a glimpse of glory for him then, but there's a look of reality. There's a look at reality of the gospel tomorrow. Not everything is going to be this beneficial. We might labor just like Dr. William Leslie. But one day there is coming a time when things are going to be different. Now, you come to verses 11, 12, and 13, and it's kind of, uh, because of the, the, the original language here with this mood, it's not a prayer per se, but it's kind of a prayerish type of thing. Uh, in verse 11, he says, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. But this is what he goes on and says. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another. When we go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, we're going to realize that this prayer is answered, that that's exactly the kind of people that they had become. They were indeed abounding in the love that they had for each other. But notice verse 13, and this is where we'll spend a few minutes. He says, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father. He's going to establish your hearts blameless and holy. This is an exciting verse of scripture because it looks to the future. It looks to the future revelation of a body of believers who are fully established without blame. Literally the word blameless or unblameable means to find no fault with. We are in the process of sanctification. We are growing in our faith. But is there one person here who says or could say to me, I have absolutely no fault in me? The word blameless means literally nothing can stick. It was a picture here of charges that are brought against an individual, but nothing sticks. Nothing sticks. Hmm. Can you say that today? There's gotta be at least one thing, right, in your life that's kind of, somebody could make an accusation and say, hey, you're kinda, huh, right? Hey, you're, you got a problem with this. We all have a problem with something, don't we? But there is coming a future day, he says, when you will be blameless. That whatever charges are brought against you, nothing sticks. In this sequence here in verse 13, our holiness is lifted from the realm of human evaluation. Are you with me? It's not something you're able to do. In fact, someone will always have something that they could say against you until you stand before the Lord. Do you realize that? So what we're doing is we're lifting this from down here and we're understanding that this verse of scripture is saying that it is God who has lifted you up to this point of being blameless and holy. In other words, when you are charged with something at that day, there'll be nothing that sticks because the righteousness of Christ annihilates all of those charges. Isn't that wonderful? When they look at you and they say, hey, you, you, right there, you. You say, hey. Jesus says, no. Everything's laid to my account. Everything's forgiven. Everything's paid for in full. There's absolutely no charge that can stick. And I and you, if you're a person of faith in Jesus, will be blameless on that day. Ephesians chapter 5, verse I think it's uh, 25 maybe. It talks about the fact that Christ loved the church and that's, that's a great wedding passage but it talks about Christ loving the church and ultimately he is presenting the church as his bride to himself, holy and blameless. Isn't that gonna be a great day? Are you excited about this? Notice with me here, go back to verse 13. It is God who is going to do this. It's elevated to his 
presence. Jesus brings about this redemption. We will be holy and blameless before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints, there we will be, and what joy that will bring. Are you looking forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus? Man, that's going to be fantastic, isn't it? At that moment in time, no charge will stick against me. I will be without that sin. Look at this picture for a second. A lot of different reactions in that picture, isn't there? A lot of different reactions. I was looking at this picture and I thought, this is how it could be when Jesus returns. And some people will be putting their hands over their ears saying, no, it can't be. Other people will scream out of fear. A couple are just unbelievable looks, like, whoa. But I want to be the guy in the middle. Yahoo! Aren't you there? We are going to be holy. We're going to be blameless before God because at his coming, that's going to be your reaction. You're going to be so excited about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to be the guy. Everybody else in the world, whatever they're doing, whatever they're thinking, there are going to be the children of God who are thrilled. You see, coming of the Lord Jesus is a reality that Paul speaks of, and he speaks of this, and he says, this coming is going to happen with all his saints. Revelation 19, 14, and the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. What a day that's going to be, my friends. You see, as Paul looked at these Thessalonians, he realized they weren't perfect, but they were truly, while he was concerned for them, a blessing to him. And they really encouraged him. Not only then, but he looks forward to a time when they will encourage him, yet even future, when we will all stand before the Lord blameless. My friends, let me encourage you. As you stop and you think about this church and you realize that it's not perfect, but it's making progress that all of us should bear testimony of the fact that the word of God is powerful. It truly is. It's worth laboring for. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and it's worth doing that. Are you a follower of Jesus today? Are you looking forward to that? Are you the guy in the middle? If you're not, Today would be a great time to place your faith in Jesus and know that your sin has been completely removed. Paid for in the perfect sacrifice that is Jesus there on the cross of Calvary. Let's pray. And as we bow our heads, in just a moment I'll pray. But perhaps you're here this morning and God has spoken to your heart about truly placing your faith in Jesus. The world would have us trust different things. Sometimes they add things to Jesus, believe in Jesus and do good works, believe in Jesus and be baptized, believe in Jesus and be a member of a church. But it's only believe in Jesus, faith alone in Jesus Christ that saves can have it no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father, he said, except it be through me. Will you come to Jesus? Will you come and place your faith and trust in, in him alone? If God's speaking to your heart today, in the quietness of your own heart, maybe you just yield yourself to him and place your faith in him. Maybe you're here this morning and God's speaking to your heart Maybe you've been discouraged. Maybe there's been afflictions. Maybe there's been reasons for you to quit in your own mind, things that seemed reasonable. But you recognize that God is doing a work, a mighty work in the world today. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. I just want to be encouraged. 
Maybe you've been discouraged. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. I really, I really want to have boldness. I want to hand out the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to reach out with my faith this week. Pray for me. Whatever your heart desires, would you just slip up your hand this morning? If I can pray for you, I'd ha- be happy to do that. Amen. How many would say, pray for me, Pastor Kevin, to have boldness this week to share my faith? I want to hand out some of those cards. Awesome, awesome. The Apostle Paul, when he was in prison, didn't pray for warm food or warm clothes. He prayed for boldness to continue on giving forth the gospel. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning who'd also say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. Today I'm placing my faith in Jesus. Just slip up your hand as well. I'd love to pray for you too. Amen. Father, we just rejoice in the things that you're doing in our world. We thank you, Father, for the love that you've shown us. We thank you for the benefits of the gospel. Give to each one of us, Lord, this week, I pray, the boldness to share our faith, to reach out to others with love and compassion. Help us, Father, not to become discouraged when we don't see immediate fruit in the things that we do for you. Let us look forward to that day when we come with our Savior. What a joy, what a blessing. Father, may you work in our lives. May we truly be willing to yield our heart to you. Father, I lift up those who've asked for prayer today, those who are contemplating faith in Christ. May you work marvelously. May they come to know the Lord Jesus in a personal way, knowing that their faith has made them whole, that they're truly forgiven. Father, we thank you for the work you're doing in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen.